presents an inspiring gospel reflection by Father Michael Sparrow. Father Michael is a Jesuit priest working as a writer and retreat master at the Bellarmine Jesuit Retreat House outside Chicago. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Great crowds were traveling with Jesus and he turned and addressed them. If anyone comes to me without hating his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, and even his own self, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Which of you wishing to construct a tower does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if there is enough to com for its completion? Otherwise, after laying the foundation and finding himself unable to finish the work, the onlookers should look at him and laugh and say, ha, this one began to build but did not have the resources to finish. Or what king, marching into battle, would not first sit down and decide whether with 10,000 troops he can withstand another king advancing upon him with 20,000 troops? But if not, while he is still far away, he will send a delegation to ask for peace terms. In the same way, any one of you who does not renounce all his possessions cannot be my disciple. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Welcome back to school. The school year has begun for grade school, high school, and even for many university students. And Jesus invites us into his school today. You notice the opening line of today's gospel is that great crowds were following Jesus. There were a lot of followers of Jesus. But he distinguishes and he says, if you want to be my disciple, if you want to be instructed by me, taught by me, he lays out a very difficult, very difficult syllabus for his course in today's gospel. It's a challenge to every one of us. He has those tough words, you need to hate your father, your mother. Of course, Jesus is speaking in Semitic hyperbole. He's making the dramatic point. He's illustrating the first and greatest of the commandments. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. Love God first, God has to come first, has to be the number one priority in your life. So perhaps what he's saying really is not hate because obviously the second great commandment is love one another as I have loved you. Jesus isn't contradicting himself, but he's saying very clearly and dramatically, nothing can come before God. Nothing, no relationship, no thing. Even your love for your own life, God first. And then he invites us to calculate the cost of following him. Perhaps you've read or at least heard of that famous book by the Lutheran pastor Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was executed by the Nazis for resisting Hitler. He wrote his book, The Cost of Discipleship. Being a disciple of Jesus is different than simply being a follower of Jesus. It's gonna cost us, and let's not be naive. For Bonhoeffer, it meant 
his life. Indeed, for the first 300 years of being a Christian, if you declared yourself publicly to be a Christian, you would have all of your goods taken away from you. You would be separated from your family. If that didn't work, you would be flogged. And if you still didn't renounce your following of Christ, then you would be executed. That was the norm for the first 300 years, 300 years, longer than the United States has been in existence. That was the pattern of being a disciple of Jesus. And then after Christianity was legalized with the conversion of the Emperor Constantine, there were a lot of people who just wanted to be followers on and the Desert Fathers and Mothers said, hey, this is too easy. They're not really giving their life to Christ. And they went off to the desert. And that was the beginnings of the monastic movement, of renouncing the world and saying, there's a price to be paid for following the gospel. Jesus gives us two examples in today's gospel, doesn't he? The first is about building a tower. He says, if you're going to build something, can you calculate the resources to make sure that you can finish it? In other words, do you have what it takes to go the distance? Can you pay for what you start? I must say that's a example that hits pretty close to home. I'm at the Bellarmine Retreat House, and we just recently completed a major renovation, $6.2 million renovation of the original part of the retreat house, which is 100 years old. But when we sat down and we started thinking about what do we need to do, what would we like to do in the retreat house, we had all of these grand plans. We want to do this, and we want to do this, and we want to do this, and we sat down, and what was the price tag? It came in at like $10 million. <laughs> and we talked to some of our donors, and they said, eh, I don't think so. <laughs> so what did we do? We had to scale back to what was realistic so that we could complete the project. Exactly what Jesus is talking about today. Don't start what you can't complete. Or another example that is in the news is if you're a tennis buff at all or you follow sports, you know that Serena Williams just lost in the US Open yesterday. To a competitor 11 years younger than she. She and her sister Venus were highlighted in the film King Richard, for which uh, tells the story of their upbringing, that from early on, tennis dominated their lives. Serena began her career as a, as a pro in 1995 at the age of 14. Three years later, she won the US Open for the first time at age 17. She would go on to be one of the highly, most highly ranked tennis players of all time. 858 tour victories, 73 singles titles, an Olympic gold medal, 319 weeks ranked as the number one tennis player in the world. With her sister Venus, 14 doubles titles and three Olympic golds. And yet Serena Williams, looking at herself at age 40, recognizes, I don't have the stamina to keep doing what I did when I was 14 years old, announcing her retirement, to pursue other interests, because she's calculated the cost and the cost is too great to continue. What's the cost for us to follow Jesus? Jesus is very clear. My, your following me has to come before family, before friends, before career. And here's the irony that when we place Jesus, when we place God first in our life, it puts our family in the right place. It's a right ordering. Put God first above your spouse, above your children, above your career, and it rightly orders your life 
It doesn't displace them, it puts them in the proper place. Because no human being, no thing, no career can satisfy that God-sized hole that is in every one of our human hearts. As St. Augustine wrote long ago, our hearts are restless and they will not rest until they rest in you, O Lord. God enables us to become, in the words of Matthew Kelly, our best self. So how do we put God number one in our life? How do we make this adjustment of heart and mind and time? Let me suggest that we go back to the traditional disciplines of prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. Not just the Lenten disciplines, but the disciplines for every season of our life. Prayer, private prayer and communal prayer. For those of you that are watching this on live stream, I invite you, come back, join the assembly. Worship here with us in presence. The heart of prayer is simply giving time to God, quality time. If we want a relationship to grow, we have to spend unstructured time with those we love, with those we care about, or the relationship falls apart. You can't say we're best friends and never have any time to communicate with one another. You can't say you love your spouse, you love your family, and never spend any time with them. We can't say we love God and never spend any time in the intimacy of prayer. But of course, the problem is all of us are so darn busy. There's so much to do, so many opportunities that cram every day of our life. It's a discipline to set aside time with the one who loves us unconditionally. There's a new film that's coming out starring Shia LaBeouf, star of the film's Transformers, on Padre Pio. Padre, Padre Pio died in 1968, a stigmatist, a man who could bilocate. One of the saints of our time whose life was radically centered on Christ. Recently, I uh, made my own retreat at a Jesuit retreat house in Massachusetts, and as I was flying back, I ordered a lift, and the lift driver came to take me back to Bellarmine. As it turned out, he was a Muslim. And I was wearing my clerics, and here we are coming to the retreat house, so we started talking about religion. And he said, uh, Father, how many times do you pray a day? I said, oh, well, uh, uh, about three times. Pray in the morning, try and pray in the middle of the afternoon, Some, sometimes in the late afternoon, always in the evening. He said, we Muslims pray five times a day. And I said, do you pray five times a day? He said, yes. I said, do you have your prayer mat with you? He said, it's in the trunk of my car. Five times a day. I don't know that there are a lot of Christians who convert to Islam, but those that do have converted because they admire the discipline. Sometimes I think we make it too easy for us Catholics or Christians. This is not an easy gospel today. Jesus is calling us to man up, woman up, get tough, pay the cost, discipline your life. We look at other religions, Muslims praying five times a day. We're pretty proud of ourselves if we pray once a day. What's our priority? What's most important in our life? Most of you know that I'm at the Bellarmine Retreat House. I challenge you to make an annual retreat. It doesn't have to be at Bellarmine. There are other lesser retreat houses that you could go to. <laughs> but why not take at least one weekend a year that you set it aside to deepen your relationship, that you go deep, 
Think of it as a spiritual honeymoon. Think of it as a spiritual spa. When is that next opportunity? One of my favorite stories uh, that many of the retreatants have told us, these especially men retreatants, is that when they go away and retreat and they come back, their wives say to him, you know, you're a better husband after that retreat. Or they start to get crabby and the kids say, dad, isn't it time for you to make your annual retreat? <laughs> We become our best self when God moves into the center of our lives. Jesus says in today's gospel, you cannot be my disciple unless you renounce all of your possessions. Let's embrace that discipline of fasting. Many years ago, a brother Jesuit wrote a book, Following Christ in a Consumer Society. We're inundated with materialism, with all kinds of things that we think we need. Again, the gospel calls us to put Christ first. And there has to be a discipline in what we eat, in what we buy, in the amount of television that we walk watch, in our shopping, in our screen time, and how much time we spend watching video games our time, our talent, our treasure has to be structured, has to be disciplined. And the age old wisdom of our tradition is we need to embrace voluntarily giving up good things for the sake of a greater good. If there isn't some kind of regular fasting, not just from food, but some kind of discipline where the rubber meets the road, where there's a pinch in your life, you're not gonna go stronger. We admire great athletes. No athlete ever becomes great without daily discipline and sacrifice. What are we willing to sacrifice so that we can grow strong inwardly, spiritually? St. Ignatius uses the image of spiritual exercise. He says, just as the body needs exercise to get in shape, so we need exercise to get in shape spiritually. Otherwise, we grow spiritually flabby. Our spiritual arteries become clogged and bloated. And that has to mean some voluntarily giving up good things for the sake of some greater things. And that third discipline is, of course, almsgiving, which is recognizing that everything that we have is a gift. We are stewards of the wealth that has been entrusted to us. Yes, of course, we've worked hard for what we have. Yes, of course, we have unprecedented freedoms in this country. I'm not denying that for a second. But everything that we have is a gift from God. Your good health, your intelligence, your worth ethic, your being born in this country, your being born into a family that loves you, all of that is gift. I have a good friend by the name of Tony who recently sold his business for several million dollars. Tony said, Father Michael, I'm a steward of that wealth. It belongs to God, it's God's money. Every day I pray, Lord, show me how am I to use what you have given to me. And he puts his money where his mouth is. He's full time involved in charity work right now. That's how he's spending his retirement. If you wanna be inspired, there's a new film on Mother Teresa that's just coming out. It's a documentary that documents her work as a sister and the work of her sisters of charity all around the world. With the globalization that is coming on in the world right now, we become more conscious that no country is an island, that we are interconnected one to another, and that we enjoy unprecedented freedom and wealth in this country and in this culture. We need to open our eyes to what we have and what others do not have. Hasn't that been an earmark of Pope Francis's papacy? 
Can you listen to one story about Pope Francis where he isn't talking about our need to be conscious of the needs of the poor? Having pondered God's word, we come now to the table of the Lord to be fed with the bread of life because we need to be strengthened in this journey. Let's recognize none of us can do this alone. We need each other, which is why Sunday after Sunday we gather together to reflect on God's word, to come and to support one another in this journey of faith. We're not in it alone. We need to be disciplined in our own interior spirits, but we need to strengthen one another to encourage each other in this journey because the Christian walk is not a solitary path. It is and it isn't. We need each other in the journey, which is why I invite those who are watching on Zoom, come back, join us in the community. How powerful it is to have a spiritual communion how much more powerful it is to be able to actually sacramentally receive the body and blood of Christ and be in the presence of our brothers and sisters. And here's the good news. Let me just end on this promise. God will never be outdone in generosity. Whatever we give to the Lord, we can rest assured that the Lord is going to give that back to us so much more. God will never be outdone in generosity. He said, out of the mouths of little babes, I am praised. So let's take a cue and raise our voices to the Lord in joyful praise, thanking him for all that he has given, will continue to give, that we might be disciplined in following his path of love. Amen? Heart to heart